When I was in third grade, I made an awesome discovery. Unfortunately, it was a discovery that brought me this close to getting expelled from school. Uh, the discovery was that I found that I could forge my mother's signature. <laughs> it wasn't perfect, but it was good enough. And so what I did was I started writing notes to my teacher, asking if Johnny could be excused from class today because he had a doctor's appointment. And I became known as the sickliest child in third grade because there were a lot of these notes. And what I did <clears throat> with this newfound freedom, I should say at the time I was living in Caracas, Venezuela, what I did with this newfound freedom was what anybody would do, is go, after the, go to the prohibited zone. Uh, in this case, in Caracas, it was the barrios of Caracas, the really poor districts of the city that were actually quite close to the school. And I just had an amazing experience exploring through the barrios. What I found was quite contrary to expectations. You know, people talk about the incredible poverty, the squalor, the sadness of these districts. What I found was actually something quite different. I found a lot of excitement, a lot of focus on potential and possibility. These were people who had moved in from the countryside at great expense to themselves, disrupted their whole lives to come to the city because they saw the city as a land of opportunity. So it was a very different experience, and I spent many days exploring these barrios. Unfortunately, one day, my mother came to school a little bit early and asked to pick me up and was told by my teacher, well, he's with you at a doctor's appointment. And so after long conversations with the principal and many days of detention uh, after school, I survived the experience. But the lesson that I took from that experience was a very sharp contrast between two different kinds of institutional environments. On the one hand, there was the barrio, where there were really very few formal institutions of any type. But instead, and because of that, there were incredibly rich networks of relationships, informal networks of relationships, that helped people to pull out what they needed, when they needed it. There were incredible pull platforms in this very dense, chaotic environment. And in sharp contrast to that was my school, which was a classic, what I would describe as a push institution. Schools are pretty remarkable. The minute you're born, they can predict exactly what you're going to need to learn in second grade, fifth grade, twelfth grade, college. It's all programmed out. And your job is to sit through that and take tests occasionally. Now, you can probably tell where my sympathies lie between this push institution and this pull environment. It's hard to argue with push institutions at one level. And I would say it's not just schools. I would say all our institutions are push institutions. Companies develop a forecast, a prediction. You make sure all the right resources are in the right place at the right time to meet that demand. That's a push institution. Our governmental institutions, our NGOs, all major institutions are push institutions. Enormous wealth has been created through push institutions. Enormous scale has been achieved. So it's really hard at one level to argue about the success and importance of push institutions. But what I want to focus on is a shift that's occurring on a global scale that I think is moving us in a different direction. And this shift is driven ultimately by two forces at work. There's one force, which is digital technology infrastructures that are being deployed on a global scale, have been deployed for decades now. And combined with that, you have a broad-based public policy shift, again, on a global scale, towards more liberalization, economic liberalization, freedom of movement, of people, products, money, ideas. 
different pace in different countries, different pace in different industries, but overall, if you go back to the 1950s and fast forward to today, it is remarkable how far we have moved in that public policy shift. Now, what's really interesting is these two combine the digital technology infrastructures and this public policy shift, and in economic terms, they have a profound impact. They are systematically and radically reducing barriers to entry and barriers to movement on a global scale. Now, at one level, that's huge opportunity. At another level, that's huge pressure. It means no matter what position you have achieved, there is always the opportunity, an increasing opportunity, for somebody to come in out of left field and challenge that position. So at one level, it's a world of mounting pressure. And one, one way I've tried to document this is to actually ask a fairly basic question, which is, how are companies doing? And uh, not just in the most recent quarter, not in the most recent year, but look at, let's look at it over a period of decades. How have companies been doing? To my surprise, I don't think that question has ever even been asked. At least I haven't been able to find it, much less answered. And so what I did as part of my research was to go back to 1965 as a starting point to today. And I looked at all public companies in the United States, all of them, not a sample, but every single one of them. And as the measure of performance, and we can debate this, there, there are reasonable arguments to be made. I took as the measure of performance return on assets. I said, how have companies done since 1965 to today? Well, it turns out over this period of four plus decades, return on assets has basically collapsed. It's declined by 80%. It's been a sustained erosion. There have been ups and downs based on economic cycles, but it is remarkable how long-term this erosion has been. There's absolutely no sign of it leveling off. There's certainly no sign of it turning around. So when we look in the newspaper every day and this incredible discussion around the economic recovery and how fast and how sustained and when are we going to get back to where we were, well, I've got news. This Trend line says we're not going back. We may have some temporary relief, but there is mounting pressure long term, and companies, on average, are failing to meet that pressure. I'm struck by the number of times when I go into executive boardrooms, the number of times I get the image or the metaphor of the Red Queen. Remember that image of the Red Queen running faster and faster just to stay in the same place. What I tell executives is actually the Red Queen had it pretty good. She ran faster and faster and stayed in the same place. We're running faster and faster and falling farther and farther behind. So core message is mounting pressure. These push-based institutions that were so effective and efficient and scaled and created such wealth are under growing pressure and failing to meet that. Now, the question is, why have they failed so badly? And I would argue there are two factors at work here, two shifts that need to be understood in order to respond to this pressure. One factor has to do with the notion of moving from stocks to flows. Now, what do I mean by that? In the world of the 2000th century, <laughs> 20th century, um, we had a world where the formula for creating economic value was pretty simple. You develop a set of proprietary knowledge stocks, something that nobody else knows. You aggressively protect those knowledge stocks to make sure nobody else has access to them. And then you, as efficiently as possible, extract the value from those knowledge stocks and deliver it to the marketplace. Huge wealth created, enormous scale achieved. The interesting thing, and as we move into a world driven by these fundamental forces, 
where there's more rapid change and more degrees of uncertainty, what you know at any point in time diminishes in value at an accelerating rate. So if all you do is hold on to your knowledge stocks, you're playing a losing game. And the only way to succeed in that kind of environment is to find ways to participate more effectively in a diverse and larger range of knowledge flows. Most of our companies are not built around a knowledge flow model. They were built around a knowledge stock model. And then the other shift is something I've already hinted at, which is this notion of moving from push-based institutions to pull-based institutions, where the name of the game, rather than trying to predict and forecast what the demand is going to be and making sure everything's hardwired in the right place at the right time to meet that demand, it has to do with creating scalable pull platforms where you can pull out, draw out the people and resources that you need, when you need them, where you need them. Much different approach. And when I talk about scalable, I'm not talking about things like lean manufacturing when, and lean inventories, pull-based inventory systems, which have largely been a, in, implemented in a very con confined set of companies, a very limited number of participants in those pull-based platforms. I'm talking about scalable to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and in increasing cases, millions of participants, where you can draw out those people and resources when you need them and where you need them. Fundamentally different institutional architectures. In case it's not clear by now, I certainly believe we're not here with business as usual. I think the real question that comes into play in that kind of shift is it puts the individual back in the center of the game. In a push-based model, a push-based world, the individual's job is to fit in. Fit into the institution, read the program that you're supposed to follow, and then follow it predictably. Mission accomplished. In these pull-based institutions, if you don't pull, nothing's going to happen as an individual. So you got to take some initiative. Not follow instructions, take initiative, because the unexpected has just happened. Are you going to pull in the right way at the right time? And in this context, I've gotten very interested in another topic, which is passion. Now, I spend most of my time with executives in executive boardrooms. And when I start talking about passion, I get these quizzical looks. Kind of, you know, the metaphor for me is the dog looking at the television to try and make sense out of what's going on. Um, <clears throat> and somebody, one of the executives will eventually ask me, well, John, where are you from? And I'll confess I'm from California. And all of a sudden, I'll get a lot of nods in the room. <laughs> ah, he's one of those. One of those new age types. You know, passion, yes, fulfillment and self-realization. Um, no, I actually come at passion from a completely different angle. One of my research interests has been to look at environments where you see sustained extreme performance improvement. I've spent a lot of time, for example, looking at extreme sports, things like big wave surfing. I've spent a lot of time actually in the online video gaming environments, where you're at war constantly and pushing yourself to that next level of performance. And in business environments where you see sustained extreme performance improvement. No matter how diverse those different environments are, there is one common element in all those environments. And that common element is the passion of every participant in those environments. So if you want sustained extreme performance improvement, you better have passion. If you don't have passion, it's going to be a lot harder to do that. And that's a key message that I have to executives. Now, I have found that as I talk about passion, passion is one of those words where everybody can nod their head and say, yeah, I, yeah, I understand what you're talking about. And yet, if I, I dare say, if I pulled all of you to define passion, I'd get as many different definitions as there are in the room. I want to focus on one type of passion, which we've spent some time on, which is what I call the passion of the explorer. Passion of the explorer is somebody who makes a commitment, a long-term, lifetime commitment to a domain. It says, I'm really excited about this domain. I want to learn everything I can about it. 
but my real goal is to make a difference in that domain. I don't want to just sit there and learn about it. I want to make a contribution, a difference. And I don't want to just make one contribution or difference. I want to make increasing contributions over time. That's the passion of the explorer. And there are two elements, two dispositions that come together to, uh, that define this passion of the explorer when you see it. One is what we call a questing disposition. What do I mean by that? Taken in an average corporate environment, uh, a worker who's confronted with an unexpected challenge. Uh, what's the response of the worker? Well, one typical response is to try to ignore it. You know, maybe if I avoid it long enough, it'll go away. Sometimes it does. If it doesn't go away, maybe I'll try to paper it over and hide it. And if I can't do that, I'll try to kludge some, some solution to this, this problem. But my real job is to get back to my assigned task. That's my goal here. There's another response to these unexpected challenges, which is quite different. It's the response of, wow, I never saw that before. What would I do? What could I do? This is really interesting. It's challenging me to get to that next level. So it's a very different kind of response that embraces these challenges and gets excited by them. And in fact, doesn't just wait for these challenges to emerge, but actively seeks them out. And if you can't find the challenges, you get bored and you quit. So questing disposition is critical. Another key element is a, um, what we call a connecting disposition, which is you find that people, passionate explorers, are constantly trying to connect trying to find other people who share their passion. But in many cases, we still have that mindset that you go to work to earn a paycheck. And if you have a passion, it's great to pursue it outside of work. But to try to integrate passion and profession, that's a fool's errand. Get real. Well, I've got to say, in this world of the big shift, if you haven't integrated the passion with the profession, it's going to be more and more challenging. And the opportunity is to turn stress into excitement by connecting with others and embarking on shared challenges that really can drive you to that next level of performance. Thank you very much.